I'm always tying flies. For me, it's an, it's an ongoing process just to modify my patterns, changing colors, you know, sizes, weights. Um, even the color of the beet head sometimes uh, works or makes a difference. And uh, all the new materials you get on the market, you know, you go from normal feathers to synthetics and uh, just to get a little bit more of a tweak in the, in the pattern and, uh, yeah. If you, if you plan a, a certain trip in a certain area, you've you got in, in mind what yeah, time of the year, what, what insects are around and uh, well just it's a bit of a kick to catch fish on your own flies. You know, it's, uh, it's a little bit less bling bling on it like what you can buy in the shops and uh, yeah, for me it's, it's, it's just a good feeling to catch fish on my own flies. You've got a pattern what, what works and uh, you tweak it around a little bit here, a little bit there, you test fish it and then go back on the bench and then make it a little bit heavier, a little bit lighter. Um, it never stops, it never stops. It's an ongoing process. You fish on your own just to to figure out how the pattern is going so we can take it later on over into your guiding you know it's, it's, it's all about getting your clients on fish and uh, you, you, tie, you tie three four five different patterns and then you know you got two who work pretty well and then you, you change the color you, you do that and if you think it's uh, you, you got a good uh, result on that one then you take it into your guiding and uh, fill the box up maybe to 20 or 30 of them it's all about the guiding. Yeah, on that particular trip, um, I got I got a couple of patterns in my mind. You know, it's, it's early season, so a couple of nazis around, a couple uh, colobariscos around, and. Uh, we hope that we get some dry fly fishing going on, so uh, yeah, I'm focused on uh, getting a couple bigger dry flies. And uh, yeah, I was really thrilled to get out there and uh, see how they work, how they perform. It's, it's always it's always great to uh, spot the first feeding fish. Well, first checking out what he's doing. Is he moving, just sitting, or is he maybe even looking up? You know, can I put a dry on? Uh, just study the behavior of the fish, and uh, as soon as I've got a bit of a, a hint, you know, just get the new flies out of the box and give it a go.
Yeah, sometimes if you if you miss the first fish, um, well, it, it doesn't really bug you because you know you find another one. You just have to get into the rhythm. And uh, sometimes you're on the river and the fish are just not on. You know, it takes an hour or two, but you take that in, in into account and you just keep on going. You know, till you find a suitable fish. It doesn't matter if you catch a big fish or a small fish, it's a fish, got fins, and uh, it's the same work you put in there. And just in the end of the day, I mean, that, if that weigh net goes to eight pound or, or four pound, it, it's the same feeling for me. Well, that never stops, mine. I mean, I dropped my last client off yesterday, and if we hadn't had uh, bad weather today, I would have been out today. You know, it's a, it's a passion. It's not that I have to, you know, I want to. And that's a big difference.
that, how good does that feel? Oh, that's pretty awesome, but that's pretty much what we expected. And uh, we showed up in the morning with that little bit of drizzle, humid, it's not cold, and uh, a couple of collies in the air. Well, we had a really good feeling that we're in for some decent drive for fishing, and uh, well, that's as good as it gets.
I had pretty good dry fly fishing all day and uh, I've seen a really good fish on the opposite bank and put a downstream cast on him and uh, he came up like the normal thing in the world and uh, I just pulled that fly straight out of his face. What really sucked. <laughs> After I messed it up, the, I mean, the fish came back not even five minutes later and just zipping dry flies off the surface like nothing happened before. And, uh, Mike went in there and uh, a cast later and he was on. Sucks even more. <laughs> on the other side, Hans had a go at and he pulled the dry out of its mouth. Uh, just a really beautiful cast, just a tough set, having to pull it back away. Five minutes later, the fish is out feeding again, right in the corner, and um, got slightly above him, made a big cast, landed it right on him, and he just come up as slow as anything and ate it. And um, yeah, biggest fish today, it's a really nice fish. I ended up having a really good fish this day, um, right hard up against the far bank and I had trees up behind me. So the only chance was sort of a single hand spay type cast um, with a dry fly and he was rising just very occasionally right in the slack water and then right in the back corner of this um, near the bank, just in front of a flax or a fern or whatever it was. Pretty happy with the cast, but sort of got it low on the strike and, and broke it off straight away, which was pretty gutty. I didn't get to the top of the strike, let the rod soak it up. The rod was quite low and it hit, just bang, it was enough to break him. That whole sequence reminded me of a time I'd fished with Hans earlier in the year um, down south further in this gorgy pool on a rainbow. And the same sort of thing happened. He came over and smashed it and as soon as he hit it, he went away on, on a small terrestrial. later and as I'm striking he's, he's already had it and going away and I've hardly got the rod off the water so the, the fly broke straight away because the rod couldn't soak up the, the set and obviously these guys are pretty spooky when you use them quite light tippet so you, you break the five pound off pretty easy if you get the strike wrong. Oh. What happened there? 
they smashed it on the right hand side. And I passed it off. I love the fact that sometimes it feels like you're the only place on the planet, you know, when you're, when you're fishing in one of these wilderness rivers. You know, you don't hear anyone, you don't see anyone, the only sounds you hear are yours or nature, you know, or your mate offering advice. Um, but you, you just get totally immersed in, in that sort of natural amphitheatre, you know, and, and as much as I love being at home and, and and doing stuff around the house, it, it's, you know, it's the place I want to go when I really want to free my spirit. And there's just nothing like it in the world, really. Waking up after a, a really good night's sleep in a tent to a beautiful morning with the, the promise of what lies ahead for the day is just incredible. It's just, the feeling you get is such a feeling of freedom. 
in anticipation that it's just, uh, I think it's one of the main reasons why I fly fish, to be entirely honest. I had a recent trip that highlighted how crazy and fickle fly fishing can be. We got to this quite pressured fishery and the fish were really grumpy um, to the point where they really weren't moving. A lot of them were sitting around, they were moving a little bit. Every second fish might have been moving a fraction, but they weren't really feeding. So I ended up dragging out a great big Kelly Gallup sex dungeon, articulated streamer, huge thing, and, and started throwing that. And I got a little bit of interest off a couple of fish. So he pressed on, and that was the only thing that would work. I think the, the, the visual aspect of throwing big streamers is quite different here in New Zealand too because it's not something that's done as much as it is, for example, in the States. Um, and seeing those big trout just fly at your streamer and crush them in close is, is pretty bloody special and, and not a lot of people use them. You know, I think um, maybe I think people are missing out. It's always going to work and often it's a one and done, you know, if that's your first option and you slap that down in the water and you strip it past them and they don't chase it, you, that's probably your shot done. You know, but you've got to have the confidence to maybe tie it on in the first place.
later in the afternoon after a bit of soul searching and, and searching through the fly box. So I finally figured oh, I've got to put something tiny on. So I went to a tiny little ant pattern yeah, that my late mate Clayton Nickel tied, a little tiny sort of size 18 ant and threw that at this fish after it refused other dries and it came up like the most natural thing in the world and ate it. So it was a ridiculous situation where the, the biggest flies in my fly box, or the smallest, were working and nothing in between. So, I mean, it just you know, brings home that, you know, you've got to think outside the box a little bit sometimes and not just be stuck too much in what you think always works in that particular river. You know, it's bloody minded to keep throwing the same flies and expecting, you know, a different result if they're not taking them. So, um, you know, you always got to have a, you know, a broad range of flies and a broad range of skills to put those flies in the right place with the right action or the right drift. It's cracking the code as part of the, um, the allure of fly fishing too. It's n never easy and I think that's the attraction. You know, and, and one day they might be doing something and you think, right, I've got it, I know what they're doing. The next day, in the same section of the river, they're doing something completely different. And they might have gone from big size 12 swimming mayflies to, to tiny 18 emerges, you know. And it could be caddis or, you know, some stoneflies or it could be, you know, mayflies, you don't know. It's changing from day to day. So it's not like the US in that they have, you know, hatches that you could almost set your watch to. You know, there might be blue winged olives or trichos or whatever. And that happens regularly and at about the same time each day. Here it's different. They're very opportunistic, the fish here. So you've got to, I think having a feel for the fishery and understanding what normally happens um, helps, but you've still got to be open-minded and ready to go through the fly box when needed because they'll test you. You know, you've got to bring your A game.
<laughs> I mean, the great thing about the South Island is that you have extremes. You know, it's a land of extremes. You have massive mountains, big rivers, small rivers, spring creeks, you know, braided rivers, you know, fine gravel rivers, big bouldery, rocky rivers. You have everything and the colour of the water changes from azure blue to emerald green to tannin stained, you know, and everything in between. You know, and I think that's what I love about the South Island. It's, it's just, it's mesmeric almost. It's hard to explain to like, for example, potential clients, you know, they say, what's it like there? And you say, well, look, you know, it's, it's every possible type of scenario you can think of in fishing really. You know, and you can experience that over a couple of days especially if you're willing to move around a bit. And so that's always um, captivates me. You know, if it was the same all the time, I probably would tire of it a little bit, but it's, it's just so diverse. Nice, mate. Beauty, eh? That's now, release him. Yeah. Look at the bum on that. Yeah. Bum. <laughs> I can't believe you just said that. All right, in he goes. fish tend to mirror the colour of the water. You know, you get a Tannistan River and the, and the fish are very red and big spots and colours and yellow halos and golden bellies, you know. And so that's the thing I think that, that me, especially as a photographer, likes the most is that it's every fish you catch will have a different story from a different place in a different colour, you know, and I, th and I think that's special.
mate of mine actually uh, decided to, to do a trip to New Zealand and uh, he asked me if I want to join and I told him if there's no fish around. I mean at that time, and that is 30 years ago, at that time I was already a crazy fisherman, you know. So, uh, well we had a look in, in books and said yeah, there might be trout around. So um, yeah, I joined the trip. Well the first three times we didn't even get to the South Island. We stuck in Turangi in, uh, in the North Island and uh, you know, you come from Europe, you catch two pound fish, three pound fish. And uh, well, in Turangi we got six pound fish, you know, and I thought, wow, that, that thing must be 20 pound, you know, six pound fish, 20, you know, just absolutely out of proportion to what we used to. So all we did was more or less fishing, 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 fishing. And uh, well, two years later again, Turangi, and then after that slowly we got to the South Island. And uh, yeah, the impression, you know, you, you fly back to Europe and your brain is in New Zealand, you know. So you get to that stage that you think, uh, well, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. I should be there, you know. I did it, and it was the best decision I ever did. The South Island is special, you know, it's just, it's more a hunting. I would say we, we don't have the numbers like the North Island. We definitely don't have the numbers like the North Island, but uh, here it's, it's, it's more hunting. You know, you have to find the fish, you have to find the right flies, you have to have a good drift. Um, the, the brownies, the brownies are pretty picky, you know. I mean, if you fish the North Island, for example, the Tongariro, you fish dry flies and uh, it's heaps of rainbows in there. That rainbow doesn't want to take that fly or it just wants to destroy it, you know. There's no second sword, it comes up and bang. Uh, we don't have that here, you know. It's just, even, even if the fishing sucks, it's still a great feeling just running around on the rivers with holding your rods, you know, and have a look what's around the next bend.
I guess ultimately it's not the fishing but the places that fishing takes you. Yeah, you know, it's a bit cliche I guess but for me that, that's, that's the essence of everything about fly fishing. You know, it's a reason to go out and be in a place that literally takes your breath away.